promises. It says, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Will you stand with us and let's worship this morning.
Let's continue to sing that out. Would you lift a hand of exaltation to our Lord and Savior this morning and just say, you are worthy, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Be exalted high in the highest of heavens. Mighty are you, Lord. Worthy is your name. our worship is like a fragrant fragrant offering before the Lord. He loves for his people to worship him. And as the creator of the universe, he deserves our praise. <laughs> You're worthy, Lord. Spirit, thank you for being in this place. Thank you for moving in our services. We make your name the highest name. We exalt you, God. We thank you, God, that for this opportunity to come in and worship together as a body of Christ. Lord, help us to worship from our hearts. Help our attention to be on you. There's so many things that can distract us, God, but Lord, let, when we, let our worship, you deserve all of our attention. Continue to be with us this morning. Lord, have your way in this service. Speak to our hearts and let us be changed by your word. We thank you for these things and give you all the praise this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, before you are seated, make sure you greet those around you. Um, Ask them how their weekend went. Tell them especially they look good with that extra hour of sleep on them uh, this morning. So, And then you may have a seat. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Tuscaloosa First Assembly. We're so glad you decided to join us this morning. You could be all kind of different places this morning, but you're here in the house of the Lord, and we're worshiping together, and uh, it's just good to see everyone. And um, just want to uh, have a couple of announcements here this morning. Uh, we had an eventful weekend. It's a pretty good weekend. And uh, a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, one thing was last night we had a trunk or treat, and uh, yeah, we had, we had our cars decorated. I wish we could, uh, it, it feels a little weird not doing all the festival games and, you know, all the kids running around their costumes everywhere. And, uh, you know, they got that sugar high candy running around, you know. But, um, <laughs> but we still had a good time. We got to uh, greet and meet uh, a lot of people that drove through. And um, thank you for your candy donations, uh, for decorating or whatever else. And uh, Pastor Nora and uh, Guillermo did a great job, um, you know, putting that on. So we just thank them for that. Uh, so it was a good night, um, but another thing we did yesterday was uh, we raised some money for Speed the Light, and a lot of you were a part of that, and I just kind of want to show, um, I'm going to have Caroline come up here in just a minute, but I want to show you a recap of what it looks like to hit 3,000 volleyballs in about three and a half to four hours. <laughs> Ten, t volleyballs last year, tennis balls this year, y'all see where my mind is. <laughs>
So as you saw yesterday, I got to hit 3,000 tennis balls for Speed Light, and it honestly is my favorite day of the year. I love getting to do this. Um, there's a group photo of everybody that came. I'm so thankful that I get to go to a church where I get to do this, where y'all sponsor me and help me out. So give a hand clap for yourselves, because y'all do so much. Um, yesterday, we really had, we kept on repeating the phrase, um, God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good, and count it all as joy. Every time, I'd be like, oh my gosh, this hurts so much, somebody said, count it all as joy. And I think one time, Brad even said, like, Caroline, how much pain are you in? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like, somebody, like, got boiled alive in the Bible or something. Like, it's fine. <laughs> um, but I'm so thankful that I get to do this. Every time that y'all give to one of my fundraisers, you're not only giving to help the best people out there, missionaries, people that give their lives so others can live in the freedom of Jesus, but you're also giving... Um, and making my dreams come true. I love this. I want to do this for the rest of my life. Um, and I'm so excited for next year, my last time. So, yeah. So, currently, uh, we've raised $2,510 uh, of a $6,000 goal. So, uh, you, you can. there's plenty of ways to give. You, know, you can give in the uh, offering. You can give... Um, you can just hand me a check, you know, or uh, <laughs> you can give online uh, at our Tuscaloosa First Assembly app. Uh, there's a give option there, and it's real easy to do, and you can just hit other for Caroline. But uh, it's, it was really cool yesterday. Uh, it was a group effort, you know, for sure, um, spearheaded by Caroline. But, you know, our youth group showed up. We got some of them here that uh, were snagging all these, uh, not volleyballs, tennis balls. Um, so we had a good time out there with that. I think after about 2,000 uh, tennis balls, I thought we was going to have to call a paramedic or something because she was, like, shaking. You know, she, she's like, I can't hit anymore. I'm like, you can do it, 1,000 more. <laughs> think about all the missionaries uh, and what they got to do. But, no, she did great. And uh, thank you for being a missions-giving church. So, uh, again, we just want to say thank you. All right. I got a chance to watch some of that from 1,000 to 1,500 and she hit a couple of them out of the park, home runs. <laughs> and so she was really, well, that's when you had a lot of energy, I think, is when she was hitting them over the fence. But uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. I'm going to jump right into what I'm going to be sharing this morning. Uh, two days from now, we're going to have one of the most important days, if not, well, one of the very most important days for America, and that's um, it's Election Day. November the 3rd, Tuesday, and uh, this is the second part of a message I started last Sunday, Jesus, the Church, and Politics. I mentioned a couple of authors. I don't know if you've had a chance to, to read the article by John Piper and uh, Dr. Michael Brown, both of these men. Um, I have books by both of them. Uh, John Piper's Desiring God, uh, Hunger for God is the best book, one of the best books I've read on fasting. It's a great approach to fasting. Um, he pastors up in, uh, I think, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, a great Bible teacher. Uh, he wrote uh, a perspective on the election this week. Uh, Dr. Michael Brown wrote a response to Pastor John Piper's uh, article. And they came to two different conclusions uh, as to what to do on Tuesday. Pastor John Piper concludes that for him, the best thing for him is, is not to vote at all. But he had a lot to say about those who are voting, which I found a little odd. You know, that you, you come heavy on some stuff, but you're not participating. I tend not to listen to people that do that, that they don't participate, but they are complaining about what's in front of them or what's happened. Um, but you're well aware of the toxic nature that we're in politically. If you're not, it's because you've been maybe in, in a sleep-deprived coma or something. Uh, something's going on there. But uh, it's very, very, the Facebook wars, the Twitter feeds, it's just people at each other, and it is high energy, to say the least. And uh, I'll be honest with you, this is, you know, election. I've, I always enjoy going to the polls on that Tuesday and Last four years ago, we had to do absentee ballot because we were flying back from Colorado on election day in 2016. In 2016, I, uh, I made a statement before the election 
Um, and just just mention about the importance of the election in four years ago and and I said I'm going to be voting for my grandchildren basically I've lived most of my life but I'm very concerned about my grandchildren we have five two of them are girls and uh, when you had policies in place or were starting to be put in place that boys who consider themselves girls could have access to the girls restroom now I don't know it's kind of like common sense for me but I just have a problem with that um, and then there's some places that still, like, if, if a boy says that he thinks he's a girl, he can compete in girl sports. And there's a reason why there's a women's professional golf uh, t uh, association and a men's. And, the, you know, it's discriminating against the men because the women get to tee up the ball closer to the green. There's just something wrong with that. Well, obviously, we know that there's a difference between, between the two genders, and it's not fair for boys in their anatomy to compete in girls in track and field. And this is, this is a culture that was kind of getting really, really more and more prevalent in 2016. Um, I got a really nice email from a visitor that Sunday that I made that mention in, in four years ago, and she, was, she laid it on me heavy, just told me how wrong I was and all of that. And I, and I wrote her back a nice email saying, I appreciate your perspective, and, uh, but I disagree with you. And, uh, and I believe the principles I disagree with you on principles that are, are based on the Word of God. So I'm going to take you to the Word of God. How about that? You cannot fail going to this book to find your answers. This book will tell you exactly where to put your feet and what to be for and what to be against. I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 5, if you want to turn there. Matthew ch chapter 5 starts the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and it goes all the way through 7. These are three chapters, and they're amazing. One sit-down moment Jesus has, and Matthew records everything. Well, I don't know if he recorded everything, but it must have been a long sermon when you go from through chapter 5 and 6 and 7. And you know how chapter 5 begins? The Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it goes through the Beatitudes, and then he starts getting into subjects that are everyday subjects for people, like praying or sin, and what, is, what constitutes a sin. Sometimes Jesus would take the law, and he'd put the law in front of the people, and then he would say, but the law comes up short. Let me give you an example. He said, the law says it is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. But he comes back behind that and says, but I say unto you, which means he's taking that principle to a higher level. He said, but I say unto you, if a man looks on a woman with lust in his heart, he has committed adultery already in his heart. So what he's doing is bringing a higher understanding of what is right and what is wrong. It's not just the things you do, it's sometimes the things you think and the things you ponder. It's stuff that's going on inside of you, and he does this again and again. But between the Beatitudes and his touching on all of these different subjects, he makes a statement that I believe makes a condition of everything that he said before or after that. And this is what begins in verse 13. If you'll look at verse 13, this is what he said. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And this is his action point. He's telling them who they are. Now he's telling them what they're supposed to do with who they are. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So here's the question I'm going to pose to you this morning. Are you going to be salt, God's salt on Tuesday? Are you going to be God's light on Tuesday? Are you approaching 
Whatever you're going to do Tuesday, if you've already voted, have you approached it as God's salt and God's light? He said, he didn't say you have salt or you have light. Use it. He says you are salt. You are light. Meaning you and I have the effect. We, we have the possibility and the probability to affect culture by who we are in Jesus. He said salt is only good if it's really salty. And light is really good if it's not impeded light. And then he says our lives should be obvious to people. So our light should shine to people so they can see through our actions who the Lord is and come to know him as Lord. This is a different way to measure saltiness and radiance and its effect and how we affect our culture around us. How salty are we? And how bright is the light in our lives? A question from last Sunday, and I believe Shane's going to put it on the board from Andy Stanley. I'm coming back to this second question he asked that I referred last Sunday. Are you willing to follow Jesus when following Jesus creates space between you and your political party, your party's platform, and your party's candidate? Now, it seems to me that there is not much interest in a political party's platform. I might be wrong here. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you've read any part of the platform. But probably if I did ask that, it would show that there's not much interest in it. Because we don't bother with it. We're either too busy or we, we're just kind of like going by advertisements and, and quick sayings and, and words here, words there. And we didn't really investigate what a party's plan is. Because I think it's more dangerous to put more emphasis on the personalities of parties instead of what they said they're going to do if they have the power to do it. And Pastor John Piper, in my estimation, did exactly that. He put more emphasis on the personalities of party than the party platform. And I really was saddened by that because I have such high esteem for him. So, in case you think that I shouldn't be touching on this today, let me just remind you that the Lord holds me responsible for what I'm preaching today. And he holds you responsible for hearing it. And those who have already voted as believers, he, here, here's a, a verse in the Bible that should ought to kind of make you a little nervous. Because I think we probably all would kind of watch what we say if we knew we were being recorded. But Jesus, it's like I heard someone say in a Christian context, in a structure, church structure context, is, is that on the record or off the record? I said, well, I, I thought it's all being recorded. I don't, I don't think there's anything in the kingdom of God off the record. Like, well, Lord, you, you can't listen to this and you can't record this because this is off the record. This is just me talking. But he said this, we will give an account for every idle word. I don't know about you, that kind of scares me. It scares me enough to say, Lord, um, what, I, what I might have said yesterday that was kind of like, really wasn't proper or I wasn't thinking. But he says, we're going to give an account. If he's going to tell us we're going to give an account of every idle word, I really think he's going to cause us to be accountable for what we do. Especially how we choose leadership. So here we are, two days away from giving the consent, our consent to a political party to be in control and to execute their plan. And their plans are stipulated in their platforms. So allow me for a moment just to look for the effects of where salt and light, the influence of who we are as Christ followers... Let's see where our effect is going. How about that? Is that okay with you? Well, I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to preach it anyway. Let me, let me just make a point about the Democrat platform because there's only two, there's only two people that's going to be a uh, possible president after next week or after the week after that or 
Maybe the week after that. We don't even know the way, the way it's shaping up. There might be like a month long. So who, who knows what, how that's going to go. But there's only going to be one or two people that's going to come out of this. So I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to tell you the framework by which you should, as a Christ follower, do. The Democrat platform is 90 pages long, if you haven't checked it out. And I did a word count. I didn't count the words. I did a word count. That's different, right? If you have a, a, a word document, it's really easy to look at the word count. Oh, it's 42,861 words in the Democrat platform. 90 pages. There's no way I'm going to read all 90 pages. I kind of like speed read. Look, at, look and just try to catch the gist of it. I've done that. I did that. 2016, I did that in 2016 for the Republican Party. I did that for the Libertarian Party. Because, you know, there's a little bit of Libertarian in me. I just think that government should stay out of our business. But after reading the Libertarian Party, I said, no, I'm not for that. Those people are crazy. And I was encouraged to read the Constitution Party. And I was encouraged to vote for the guy running for the Constitution Party. I know you're all very familiar with him. I said, the guy's not going to get elected. Why, why should I vote? For yes, I love their platform. They're not going to be elected. So look at the Republican platform. And there's a footnote here I need to tell you because if you look it up, I don't know if you have looked it up, but if you look it up, you'll find this, that they did not write a platform for 2020. They did a resolution at the front end of their their. Uh, platform committee and it was whereas whereas and all of it had to do with the way the the convention had to be done with covid and and it did all these whereas and be it resolved we're sticking with what we said in 2016 <laughs> let's save paperwork but that's what it says we just we see what's going on and we really believe what we articulated four years ago still deserves our support <clears throat> so they didn't even mess with it but if you look at the 56 pages, you find that there's 36,642 words in it. Now, when going through these platforms, we should be looking for what Andy Stanley said in that quote that I quoted earlier, are you willing to follow Jesus? When following Jesus will create space between you and your political party. Space meaning you separate, Christ begins to pull you away or it pulls you away from Jesus to support something. So when we're going through the platforms, it's good, it's easy to see, would this be, would Jesus be good with this? Or would this be pulling me away from him? If I embrace this, does this keep me in contact with Jesus? Or how much of a relationship can I have with Jesus if I agree to this? It, do you think that's okay to look at it that way? I think it is, and... Since I'm preaching, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and preach it. The, there's, there's multiple issues. I, I'm not going to try to go through, but maybe a couple of them. Multiple issues. But the one issue that we cannot ignore is the issue called re, uh, reproductive rights. Reproductive rights. We know in certain settings, political settings, that that's just a code word for abortion. And it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. There's two victims. There's the mother and the child. And we saw the divide really distinctly in the hearings of Amy Coney Barrett in regard to Roe v. Wade. The Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion or that struck down states' laws. There, there was already legal abortions in America. They were in New York. There were some states that legalized it. So it wasn't like... They legalized abortion and just struck down state laws that had laws against it. Are you following me? That's a big difference. You could still get a divorce, uh, 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 you still get an abortion, but you had to go to New York or somewhere else to get it. And I, and I know people who did that and who became very involved in pro-life bef before Roe v. Wade. Seven to two decision to strike down all state law regarding abortion. In my estimation, that decision 
falls in the same category as the Dred Scott decision in 1857. And, and, and if anybody's ever read that decision, it, it is heart-rending to read that. This man and his wife, Dred Scott and his wife, Harriet, and their children were owned, were slaves, at one time owned by a lieutenant in the U.S. Army. And, and this family was sold to different ones, and, and they, they went to, into Illinois, which is a free state, and they sued for their release since they were moved to a free state. And their, their path was over several years getting to the Supreme Court. And in 1857, the Supreme Court ruled 7 to 2 that Dred Scott, as a slave, had absolutely no right in the Constitution of the United States. Zero. And it was just not like a support for slavery. They went beyond that. They took their decision. You can read this. The saint back here, he's in law school. He has read it. He and I have talked about that. They took it way past that, way past the thing about slavery. They said in their decision that free or slave, any African descent people in this country had no right under the Constitution of the United States. They were really saying you are a non-person. You think that that's the, the breadth of it? They went further than that. The Missouri Compromise that was put in place to diminish the, the spread of slavery, Roger Taney and the seven, the seven justices who voted for that struck that down as unconstitutional. And they just struck a match and lit a bomb called the Civil War. I want to tell you, just because the Supreme Court makes a decision does not make that right. There is law under God, nature's God, and the law of God, and they went against all of that in Dred Scott. The man finally got his freedom because the, the people, somebody bought him and gave him his freedom, and he hardly lived one year before he died of TB. All those years... That man was denied justice because he was a slave and because he was African descent. Terrible decision. And here, the same kind of approach to diminishing a personhood came through the Roe v. Wade. That life in the womb is a non-person, has no rights whatsoever. We have a senatorial candidate representing this state that made this statement that he's pro-life after the baby's born. You think about that. Are, are we supposed to applaud that? That you're pro-life after the baby's born. Maybe he's letting us know that he's not quite like the governor of Virginia who thinks that maybe if something's wrong with the baby after it's born, the baby's mother and the OB can just decide to keep the baby comfortable and let the baby die after birth. Some of you in this room probably have no idea what partial birth abortion was. It was so horrific, they finally stopped it. But there was people that supported that, as though that was legal, all the way through the, the third trimester. Do you realize that we are one of the rare nations in the world that approve abortion through the third trimester? We are so radically off limits with this, it's hard to imagine how far we've gotten away from God. But in the text of the Democrat platform is this one statement. We will repeal the Hyde Amendment and protect and codify the right to reproductive freedom. I know a few of you know what the Hyde Amendment is all about because some of you were in the early service. But the Hyde Amendment was voted in was voted on in 1976, not many years after Roe v. Wade, and they kind of gradually enacted it into 1980. That's when it became law. It was voted in by 312 to 93 majority in the House of Representatives under the man Henry Hyde from Illinois who sponsored it. And this is what the Hyde Amendment did. It, it barred the use of federal funds to pay for abortion except to save the life of the mother, the woman, or if the pregnancy arises from incest or rape. 
that the Hyde Amendment barred the use of federal funds to pay for abortion except for those conditions. And it says before the Hyde Amendment took effect in 1980, an estimated 300,000 abortions annually were performed using taxpayer funds to pay for it. And that party wants to strike that provision down to say your and my tax dollars will pay for it. The United States has passed one of the worst, most draconian positions on abortion. As believers, as Christ followers, we could never support that policy. Could never. You would have to convince me that Jesus was for that. Or the distance that creates between me and Jesus it's hard to fathom. And I'm responsible to tell you that, and you're responsible to listen to it, and it's on your shoulders what to do with it. The second thing is a biblical view of sexuality is under serious assault in our world today, in our country today. And we act as though not, nothing is to it. It's just stuff that's happening all around us. Pornography and child pornography, ch children... It is, I, I have granddaughters, and I, I'm like, please be a hawk watching them. Because through the social media and the things, there's more and more teenage girls that are being connected with and social media, and they end up being in sex trafficking. And this is the world that we live in today. I shudder to think what the cultural landscape will look like when sexual orientation and all kinds of sexual deviancy will be forced upon institutions like churches. Already, Chi Alpha in some states have been put under pressure to drop their code as to who could be a leader in their ministries. To not only tolerate people whose sexual orientation is not biblical or they're, they're involved in homosexuality, they're already putting pressure on on ministries, on campuses, to lower their standard because that's discriminatory. And I can't fathom if this goes further what's going to happen when what I'm telling you right now will be determined hate speech and, and I'll, I'll face a lawsuit. Let me just tell you something. I need to probably get this. My, my watch went dead on me a while ago. Well, I'll, I'll finish up here. Let me quickly tell you, not long ago in Houston, they passed an ordinance, and it was uh, the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance, and it banned discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Think about it, that you could not, you could not use either of them to make decisions as your business or your entity. And when that was passed, there was people who started a signature campaign to put it on the ballot and let the people vote on it. They needed 50,000 signatures. They got those signatures, but the Houston government, city government declared 17 or 18,000 of them invalid. But they really took a difference with five pastors who they believe were encouraging people to sign that, and they had attorneys to write out subpoenas, to have, serve subpoenas for their sermon notes. What they preached on Sunday. And there was such a pushback on that, the mayor of Houston says, okay, we don't want your sermon notes, but we want all the conversations you had to encourage people to sign a petition. That's what we're facing, friends. That's what's coming. Dr. Michael Brown alerted us to this when the same-sex union came along and, and the Supreme Court you know, validated same-sex union. Dr. Michael Brown, who spoke here and spoke at Chi Alpha on campus not that long ago, said all along, said, this is, this is not the end. Is that they don't want tolerance. They want you to approve and to accept. And this is, this is what's going on, and there's Christian evangelical denominations that are in the throes of arguing over same-sex union. 
And this is what is being pushed even more so from this cultural revolution that's going on. So where does God fit in? Where does he fit in with politics? Where does he fit in with both of these platforms? I'll shorten this up. In the 42,861 words in the Democrat platform, God is not mentioned at, at one time, not one time, not once is God mentioned at all. But LGBTQ plus is mentioned over 20 times. It's easy when you read. Just, you don't have to read and just peruse it and like this is, this is like anti-Bible. This is like, and I'm just telling you, you can read it for yourself. And you want to get with me and convince me otherwise, you, I welcome that. But this, this is what we're looking at, folks. This is, this is real. This is not make-believe. This is what's really going on. And I saw this one little paragraph in the geo platform, and it says this. The Declaration, the Declaration of Independence, sets forth the fundamental precepts of American government that God bestows certain inalienable rights on every individual, thus producing human equality, that government exists first and foremost to protect those inalienable rights that man-made law must be consistent with God-given natural rights. And that if God-given natural inalienable rights come in conflict with government, listen to this, come in conflict with the government, our court, our human-granted rights, God-given natural inalienable rights always prevails. That there is a moral law recognized as the laws of nature and of nature's God, and that, ev and that American government is to operate with the consent of the governed. In a free society, the primary role of government is to protect the God-given inalienable rights of its citizen. These constitutional rights are not negotiable for any American. That's just in one little paragraph. And God holds us responsible for what plan we support. He holds us responsible. It's all about salt and light. The praise team can come up. It's all about salt and light. Are we going to be salt? Are we going to be light? And I want to tell you, none action is not salt and light either. None action is not salt and light. It's just checking out. It's just not getting into the discussion, not getting into the process. It's not my job to tell you who to vote for. It's my job to preach from this book to tell you that God said you were salt of the earth with the light of the world. And if we exercise those dynamics in our lives, people will see that we are from God and they will turn to him and glorify him. And glorify Jesus. It's my responsibility this morning under God to tell you the truth. To seek the Lord, to encourage you to be light, be salt honor and glorify God and hopefully as you do you influence the culture around you whatever happens next week I want to tell you this book will still be the word of the Lord and God will judge us by this by this Lord I pray this morning that you forgive us our sins our sins of looking the other way our sins of modifying your truth to accommodate what others may think we should do your truth is only truth when we let it stand on its own forgive us Lord for looking the other way when something is facing us and your word tells us exactly what we should do I pray that you'd open the eyes of our heart, that you'd open our heart to you, that our minds be open to you, Lord. None of us are without sin. None of us can throw stones. Our sins were paid for on the cross, and that is where you showed your true estimation of fallen man you love us you so love the world that death on the cross would pay for our wrong 
how could we ever thank you for salvation? How could we ever thank you for dismissing our wrong and not requiring us to pay for it, but giving us mercy and giving us grace? And those who are listening by live stream, you have not given up on them and you've not given up on anyone in this room. You are for us. You're more for us than we could ever imagine you being for us. For if while we were yet sinners, you died for us, how much more will you show your great love for us since we have surrendered ourselves to you? It's unimaginable the depth and the greatness of your mercy that you've bestowed upon us. We pray for the healing of our nation, Lord. We ask for a divine intervention on this COVID virus. We ask for you to open the windows of heaven and pour out wisdom, pour out intellect upon those who are feverishly working for a vaccine. We ask God that in those laboratories, somebody would reach out to you and say, Lord, give us, give us one step here that we need to finish this, to make it effective. Bring healing to those that we know that are battling it, Lord. Touch them today, bring healing to them. But our prayer this morning, oh Lord, we cry out to you for our country. Heal our nation, Jesus. Would you stand with me? Why don't we just lift our hands as we worship and tell the Lord, I'm going to do what you want me to do, Lord. I'm going to be solved. I'm going to be light. Your soul, your light.
facing surgery this week. Carmen Morrison is facing surgery as is Nora Leah this week. So please be in prayer for them. If you need healing, just reach your hand to the master, the healer. Hear us from heaven, Lord. You're our healing. You're our hope. Those in this room who need a tangible touch of healing, Bring your power to rest upon them right here in this room. Why shouldn't we trust you? You're the healer. And why shouldn't we cry out to you, Lord, for our own health and well-being to keep us in the best place we can be, the most effective we can be for your kingdom? It matters little what we accomplish in the things that the world estimates matters much what we accomplish as salt and light. Help us to discern when it's in front of us to shine our light and to apply the salt. Neither of them are effective by holding on to it. Help us to see how we can apply your effect to the world right around us, our own culture and be ready to give an answer for the faith that we have because you created every person with great value. You love them and you have a plan for them. None of us in this room are here on this earth by accident. We're here by design. No matter what's happened to us and what's going to happen to us, we are here by your design. May that revelation be upon our minds as we leave here that we are here by the full intention of heaven and you have a plan for each of us. Anyone in this room that has yet to surrender themselves to your Lordship right here today, that they let go of their demands to have certain areas of their life under their control and finally release all of that control to you. And say, here's my life, Lord. Here's my heart, my mind. Everything about me, I give it to you. You died for me. I want to live for you. And you'll do that exactly that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for being here. We have seen a little bit of an uptick in COVID within our own ranks. So exercise, caution, wear your mask, use hand sanitizer, do your best, take care of yourself. God bless you.